Welcome to this latest edition of the Told in Stone subscriber Q&A, where I answer your questions about the ancient Greeks and Romans. If you have a question about the classical world, ask it in the comments, and I'll address it as soon as I can. Our first question today was submitted by Unclearo0989, and it is, was there ever a chance of a German becoming Roman emperor? Interesting question. Now, from the 3rd century onward, there were plenty of emperors who seemed, to the Roman aristocracy, not quite Roman in some way or other. Septimius Severus um, is the first emperor who might seem to be outside the clique. He comes from Libya, uh, Punic is his first languages, and yet, by virtue of his ancestry and his education, um, he is part of the clique. He's a member of the Roman aristocracy. Um, he's a senator from early on, he holds the usual offices, and is serving as a governor when the civil wars of 193 give him a chance to become emperor. So he's not as problematic as he might seem from his origins. Now, someone like Elagabalus, on the other hand, who, though a member of the right uh, senatorial aristocracy, um, thinks of himself as a priest king in the uh, Syrian sense, is really weird to the Romans. It doesn't quite fit. And someone like Maximinus Thrax, who comes from Thrace, as his name suggests, and is not educated, is even more problematic. But all of these men are at least Roman citizens, and are part of the establishment, however tangentially. Someone who is totally outside the system, who is not a Roman citizen, who was born a barbarian and remains so in Roman eyes, um, really can't be emperor. And a good example of this is Ricimer, the great kingmaker in the 5th century. Uh, he is Magister Militum, uh, Generalissimo, emperor in all but name, but that name matters. And so as he makes and unmakes a series of emperors in the mid-5th century, he cannot become emperor himself by virtue of being a German by origin and an Aryan Christian, and therefore doubly ineligible. However, when Odoacer overthrows Rimus Augustulus, the last Roman emperor, and becomes emperor again in all but name, um, he is a barbarian to Roman eyes. Uh, his, he speaks German. Uh, he actually may have this uh, elongated skull because of his tribal customs and a mustache, of course, that typical German thing. However, he is a Latin speaker also, and he tries to play the senatorial aristocracy. He tries to be as Roman as the Roman elite is. So even though he is um, not an emperor, the Eastern emperor won't make him such, um, he is effectively an emperor. And the same is true even more so of Theodoric the Great, who reigns after him in the early 6th century. Uh, Theodoric, again, is a German and wears that mustache, you see it on his coins, but is as Roman, or thinks of himself as Roman, as any member of the Roman aristocracy itself. So even though there are never any German Roman emperors, there are German kings who come after the emperors who are emperor in all but name and act in much the same way. Our next question submitted by Crow Magnan Overlord 5190 is, did Western Roman families migrate to the East in late antiquity? Whenever the barbarians showed up, some fled before them. The peasants could not, of course, they were bound to the land, uh, in effect if not by law, and even most aristocrats found it easier to make deals with the invaders than to flee before them. But some of those who had the most to lose did leave when the West began to falter in the 5th century. We hear about a bishop in Syria, a Theodoret, who had to cope with refugees, formerly aristocrats, from Vandal, North Africa. It had come a thousand miles or more to his parish. We all know also of many refugees who came, um, being with the sack of Rome in 410, to Constantinople, the center of the Eastern Empire. The most famous of these refugees is Anicia Juliana, the daughter and granddaughter of Western emperors. She becomes the grand dam of Eastern Roman society uh, just before and during the reign of Justinian, famously building the Church of St. Polyuctus, which Justinian feels compelled to upstage with Hagia Sophia. Justinian himself is a refugee from the West in the sense that he was born in the Latin-speaking part of the empire, the last to do, the last to do so, um, and is drawn, like so many others, toward the new Rome on the Bosporus. Our next question is, did Roman legionaries wear dog tags? This was submitted by Silver Squirrel. They did sometimes. In at least some periods and some places, new recruits are given something called a signaculum. 
This consists of an inscribed lead tablet that's uh, kept in a leather pouch hung around the neck, um, sort of right about here. And this, of course, approximates a modern dog tag in both function and kind of in form. But we don't know much about these. It's mentioned in A Saint's Life from the late 3rd century. Uh, this guy, a future martyr, rejects this inoculum as a sign of the secular world, probably because it bears the emperor's portrait, at least in this instance. But because there is very limited archaeological evidence for signocula, we assume that this practice of having soldiers wear these things was not universal, and it may have been only certain units that had them, or in certain places. Uh, as far as we can tell, in the late empire, this was replaced by tattoos, which are a much more permanent way of identifying soldiers. Our next question from Caribou Data Science is, did Roman soldiers live longer than Roman civilians? I made a video on this topic last year, and so I'm a lot and loaded with this one. As I mentioned in my last Q&A, uh, life expectancy at birth for the average Roman is quite low, probably in the early 20s, because about half of all children die before adolescence, which brings the average, of course, way down. Roman soldiers, of course, enlist after adolescence. The average age is about 20, we think. And in that sense, um, they are past the danger zone and are likely to live longer than the average, statistically, Roman. But did they live longer, which is the real question, than civilian adults? Battle is, of course, dangerous, um, as are things like punishments, forced marches, and other uh, parts of military life. But all of the more dangerous bits of serving the Roman army are pretty uncommon. Especially at the height of the empire, many soldiers never see action, or see it very infrequently. And their careers are spent patrolling, uh, doing routine duties, building roads, that sort of thing. They live in camps, most soldiers, um, or in cities beside camps, and thus in close proximity to each other, which means they are more prone to catch diseases, that's a greater risk. But to partly counteract that, there's the fact that they have much better medical care than most Romans do. A large camp will have a hospital, um, and often well-trained doctors and surgeons who can take care, take care of everyday ailments, if not necessarily serious diseases. That said, um, camp conditions were not terribly sanitary. Whenever we find a latrine that's well-preserved from this era in Roman camp, it's almost always riddled with traces of internal parasites. Now, military diet was not necessarily all that well-balanced, but it was pretty ample by ancient standards. They got bread, they got meat more often than civilians, and often received um, the vinegary wine that, though not terribly tasty, was somewhat nutritious and fairly antiseptic. Now, all of this combined, um, unsanitary camps, pretty good food, decent military, uh, health care, combined to probably give them a slight edge over at least some civilians, uh, at least over those in the city of Rome, which is terribly unhealthy for all kinds of reasons. According to a careful count of legionary headstones um, around uh, the headquarters of Legion Three in North Africa, the average age of death of a legionary there was 47. We don't have, of course, a global count for other Roman adults, but it seems likely this is probably quite close to the average of adults who survived childhood, um, mid-40s to mid-50s. And if not necessarily longer than a civilian lifespan, it's almost certainly not appreciably shorter. Last but not least, did the Romans use soap? Submitted by Justin Cage, 56. Now, there are different kinds of soap. Um, we can divide them very broadly by function, between soaps used to clean the body and soaps that clean things like fabrics. So to clean cloth, uh, Roman fullers used many substances, uh, lye, nitrum, fuller's earth, and also, most famously, urine. So often, fullers put out uh, urinals, basically these big clay jars that function as places for passers-by to relieve themselves, because urine is a great way, it turns out, to get stains out of wool and linen. Uh, at one point, after Vespasian, who is an infamous penny pincher, begins to tax them uh, for their urinals, these urinals come to be known as Vespasiani, uh, so Vespasian's piss pots. Uh, kind of a fun little anecdote about Roman history. The question, I think, that was about soap use in the body. Most Romans do not use soap. Uh, they cleanse themselves by dousing olive oil over the skin, often in the baths, 
and scraping that clean, along with all dirt on the skin and other impurities, with a sharp-edged striggle. So this this motion, and the oil plus the dirt in your skin tends to come off in one fell swoop. But the Romans are aware of soap used to clean the body. Their northern neighbors are very fond of this. Um, so when they conquer Gaul, they discover that the Gauls are using a combination of animal fat and ashes to clean their hair. The Germans also are using a similar substance uh, to both dye their hair, make it more blonde, for example, and clean themselves. But the Romans never seem to have really adopted soap, uh, body soap, in any widespread way. And for most, olive oil and strigil were the way they kept themselves clean. Well, that's a wrap. Thanks very much for watching, and if you have a question, ask it in the comments. Have a great day.